We have uh, Professor Harvey J. K. and Alan Minsky. How old is your grandchild, Professor K? Six. Six oh. and a half soon. I, I'm going to do something for your grandchild. You know what? Guess what? What? It's possible. I'll have him come on next Thursday night. Well, let me do this for you. Let me do this for your grand. Is it a, okay? Ready? It's Toby. It's a guy. Is is a boy. Toby. I'm doing this for Toby. You ready? I'm Toby, ready. This is, my, this is my gift to Toby. Spell IHOP. You know what? The International House of Pancakes. I <laughs> I want you to spell IHOP and then add the word Ness at the end. Spell IHOP and then add Ness at the end. You want me to do this, right? Yes. Okay. I H O P. You want me to wait? Do I spell all the way through Ness as well? You say Ness at the end. Spell spell I H O P Ness. Do it again, please, for Toby. I H O P Ness. I, okay. That's not working. You don't realize what you just. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. <laughs> This is terrible. Everybody out, everybody out there on the in the YouTube universe. Let me try it on Alan. It's just so juvenile. I saw, I saw it on TikTok last night. I can't sleep, so it's like four in the morning, and I'm like howling. Some like a seven year old kid walks up to his grandfather and on TikTok and does this. Alan, mm -hmm. uh, spell mm -hmm. IHOP and then add the word Ness at the end of it. I H O P Ness. That is really ridiculous. That's mm. childish. That's something. Mm. I got you to say penis. Yeah. Wow. I tricked you <laughs> into saying penis. You should hang out. You should hang out with my. Well, my daughter is probably a little too mature for this. So it yeah. made me so happy. And then we'll, well, then we'll talk about Nina Turner. I don't know why this made it made me so happy to see a young boy walking up to his grandfather tricking the father the grandfather and the father pre grandfather pretending to be angry because he got tricked and because penis is kind of a, you're not supposed to it's i don't know why it makes me so happy to see something like that i don't know i think it's, yeah no that, that so now that did you get you get tricked into that i was typing an email to somebody because it was so engaging uh, while you guys were, I was appearing on this 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 uh, talk there's show. There's you something, were talking to professor. Something they tricked universe. into that. Now David's going to take that and just play that over and over again. I've you been know, doing it to everybody, but it's there's something universal about it. It's so harmless and childish and innocent at the same time. Nina Turner, hmm. what hmm. happened? Um. Uh, yeah. No. Okay. So from. Um, that to this, um, Nina Turner lost uh, an isolated special election in, you know, early August, a summer election. The turnout was low, though, arguably not that low for a, a special isolated special election in August. The amount of money that was spent on it far exceeds all the other special elections that have occurred so far in this cycle. A few dead Congress people and then people were brought into the administration to fill their positions. Um, she was a heavy favorite. Um, nobody, nobody believes that the person who won uh, inspired the money that was donated into her campaign and also to support the campaign as external expenditure packs, super PACs, and a ton of money poured in in the last six weeks of the election that uh, just blitzed the Cleveland um, area with ads that were, um, I mean, billboards, TV ads, um, people would get things in the mail that claimed that one of the most vocal advocates for Medicare for all and $15 minimum wage as a federal minimum wage did not support those things. And that only Chant Chantel Brown, the other candidate did. So total lies. And then, you know, obviously Nina's, Nina Turner is a very forthright uh, person. It's one of the reasons we love her so much. She doesn't uh, pull her punches. She, uh, and you know, look, you say what she said about uh, Trump versus Biden, you know, whatever you want to make of it, uh, it, it and you know I'm sure you know in retrospect there are a lot of people who no doubt wish she had never said the statement but it's very it's very it's very effective it remind captures, us what she said remind us what she said oh you know I don't even want to but this was on billboards all over Cleveland in particular they hit on a comment which was 
you know, are you going to vote for Joe Biden? And her answer by way of saying, you know, yes, was, yeah, because you'd rather eat half a bowl of shit than a full bowl of shit. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I mean, you know, look, Joe Biden's career as a politician in, in the Senate has been atrocious. I mean, you get this little clip of him going back and forth with Elizabeth Warren. What's that about? That's basically the root of the inability of people to pay their debts in the country, to get bankruptcy, to be able to, you know, somehow address the, the personal crisis they have with student loans. This guy is the, is the person who did all the biddings for the credit card companies and corporations. Look, he's he is responsive to, to some decent progressive measures in in the public policy they're putting forward now, that's because there's stronger progressive appetite in the Democratic caucus than there has been in years, Um, no doubt in part because of the popularity of the Sanders campaign. So that's coming forward. But still, Biden has just undercut the the, uh, big bills for the infrastructure package. I I want to stay on, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, Yeah. I want to stay on Nina Turner because I think Professor Kay is going to say what I'm thinking better, please. Let's hear what Professor K has to say. Uh, I'm sure it's not what you think I'm going to. I would just start off by saying, and this is I'm I'm more and more convinced that progressive left people. When they bring in celebrity progressive left people, I, I just don't know. I don't know what good it does them. OK, what do you mean by she is a celebrity? No, no, he's referring she, to the rally. He's referring to the rally the two I, days before. I mean, they're just, you know, they, you know, on the liberal, progr- well, on the progressive websites, you know, uh, Cornel West went to Cleveland. I'll use him as the prime example. I, I don't know who that's supposed to gather. Supr- who's going to respond to that? Who isn't already responding? I mean, the trick would be to get lo- local people. All right. And, and if they're worried about that, what is it? big bucks for Israel group, whatever, then go out and get some, you know, Cleveland Jews. Or, I mean, I don't know what they did on the ground for those kinds of things. By but- the way, that was going to be the other name for the Indians. <laughs> so the Guardians, they were going to go, the Cleveland Jews. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just, you know, what's funny. Can, I'll just tell you a little quick thing. I mentioned this to Alan earlier when we were trying to figure out how to get how to how to make sure we knew when we were going to go on tonight. We were talking a little bit. And I said, I'm doing a show on Sunday night. You remember um, Lauren Ashcraft, who we had on the show one time? Yes. Who, who was, yeah, who was running against it. Well, in the primary, trying to secure the Democratic nomination for the I guess that's the east side over to Queens congressional seat, Carolyn Maloney's seat. And my, she, my congresswoman. Yeah. And she launched a um, she launched a, a podcast recently, a YouTube show, a Sunday night thing. Um, biting commentary. And it's kind of cute. She opens up each show trying some new food on in the show. Anyhow, so she asked me the other day, would I come on this Sunday night? And I, I said, absolutely. I, I I really would enjoy talking to you. And then I also have, you, you, you also know Kale Brooks, the producer for uh, Jacobin. Yep. And I mentioned to Kale, oh, and we decided, sorry, Kale, um, Lauren and I decided we would try to talk about left unity. And, and I was texting with Kale. And I mentioned to him that I was going on the show Sunday night and we're going to talk about left unity. And, you know, my point was what a mess things are on the left. And he said, yeah, I just wonder how much unity we can ever create without another candidate like Bernie. OK, something like that. Fair. I mean, that's the kind of thing we would all agree with. Yeah. You know, so I just wonder. And then I was and then I was thinking about, you know, this this um, the campaign with Nina. And by the way, I mean, I'll I'll make it clear. I don't have a lot of money to give politicians. I give small amounts, but I did give a few times to Nina Turner. I thought anything to enhance the numbers of what's known as the squad. OK, because you don't need a lot of numbers. You just need enough numbers to make sure that the left cannot be ignored in the House. Right. Which is where the budgets get generated. So, you know, I, and I was just thinking about where the names that I that I saw coming across and. I don't know. I, I just wonder about all this stuff. And, and Cornel West, I mean, he's an exciting teacher. I understand that. But I remember being on a show some years ago with a black minister, um, Mark Thompson. And I said to him, hey, um, Cornel West just came out for Bernie Sanders. And he said, who's that going to impress? 
And I, I don't know. It's just these thoughts that I have that what are we doing wrong? You know, it's all these things. I'm just accumulating these. What are we doing wrong things? So a lot of us. Love. But I'll also tell you one other thing, and that is that. Well, let me let me just tell you. Great. I mean, Nina Turner's great, and she's got so much energy. My daughter from New York is here right now, and you know, she was she was kind of she was upset too, and she said, "Just amazing, you know, so much energy and enthusiasm. It's exactly the kind of candidate you want." But I don't know the nature of her speeches. You know, Alan would know more about that in terms of how she addressed Ohio. So all these are the kinds of things that I've been thinking about. Yeah, I I, I think. I, I agree with everything you're saying. Twitter, podcasts, YouTube are not the real world. And, you know, all of us lob these uh, bombs from the safety of our own ideological bunker and think we're actually making a difference. And the fact is the voters in Cleveland, Ohio 11th, they're not looking to Twitter. They're not looking to Cornell West. They're looking at what's right in front of them. And I don't I don't think they are, David. I think I'm sorry. First of all, the turnout was very skewed. The suburbs voted a lot more heavily than Cleveland. I think that if anything, they are looking at the entire political system as something that their entire lifetime, the majority of the district's very poor. And the suburbs and the very rich suburb of Shaker Heights voted at a two to one clip. Uh, it looks like, Nina, yes. And it looks like if you take out the suburbs um, and you take both counties other than the suburbs, it looks like Nina probably won slightly. OK. And she won on Election Day and she lost on the early voting. And um, so, you know, I think it's it's the disconnect. So the question here is, how do you get um, the constituency that you're trying to serve in a place like Cleveland to come out? And who, did the, who did the African-Americans favor? Well, that's those numbers are still being crunched, but it looks like it's very close, if not slightly for Nina, because oh, the white okay. suburbs voted overwhelmingly for overwhelming heavily. And some in the, like in Shaker Heights around like 85, 90 percent. And there was two to one turnout in the suburbs compared to the city. So, again, this is a big thing. You have very depressed votes. I mean, Who you know, the congressional black caucus endorse um, against Nina. And Clyburn came out. Yes, but, but we did have some. We had the Cleveland Plain Dealer, the major paper endorsed Nina, the mayor of Cleveland endorsed Nina. You had uh, not just squad members, but people like Jamie Raskin endorsing Nina. Nina had more high profile endorsements other than the Black Caucus. Of course, she has a lot of people in it, but it was just listed as the Black Caucus, not every member. And uh, Clyburn and Joyce Beatty and Hillary and Clinton. Hakeem Je- and Hakeem Jeffries. I'm not sure about Jeffries. Yeah. I mean, Hakeem Jeffries, who many say will be the next speaker. Yeah, right. Just, That's as, right. just as bad as Pelosi, if not worse. He's African-American. Who did Fudge endorse? Her. Um, uh, tacitly Brown, but through her relative. I think yeah, as a member of the right. administration, she yeah, felt she mother, shouldn't do that. Yeah. Her mother came out yeah. and spoke. So what does that say about the African-American voting bloc, which is the most important bloc in the Democratic Party. If you can't win, am I wrong to say that if you if you're a Democrat and you can't get female African-Americans on your side, you can't win? Yeah, no, I mean, party loyalty. Is that true? Is that true? Uh, As a general statement, I think it is. Um. Yes, but again, the election wasn't really lost there, though. Nina should have won more there. She definitely outperformed Bernie Sanders in the district. OK, good. Um, so what are we doing wrong then? What are, what, what are we doing wrong with the African-American community? It would be nice to have an African-American. Here. Yeah, there, there's, no, there's no doubt. There, there's no doubt that the loyalty matter to the of the party. And with that being implied in the comment about the the bowl of half bowl of shit, right? But just the idea that that Brown was going to be fully loyal to Biden, and that was a question, and they were forcing it and making it seem like a big question with Nina. Is was the left that, is the left not connecting with the African American vote? Yes, because the key word there is vote and not community. Okay, so what are we doing wrong? So you can blame the Jews 
for Nina Brown losing. You can blame this one Jew who has a she's the heir to a fracking Melman, right. I'm sorry. The guy Melman. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And and I hear this a lot. It's all her fault. This one Jew who donated a million dollars to Chantel Brown. That's why Nina Turner lost, which to me is like Hillary Clinton blaming Putin. Well, look, it's not as complex as a national presidential election. And there was a singularity to that moment in this race. Who had more uh, money? Yeah. Who had more money going in? Who had, Nina Turner wasn't broke. No, Nina Turner had a lot of money, but she didn't have more money. money. She didn't have dark money. She didn't have dark money that that was allowed to basically lie about her the way that that she then and then she wouldn't have done it because Nina's too ethical to this to start like spinning lies about Chantel Brown. I mean, there were lies. There were door mailers saying that she didn't support policies that she supports, you know, straight Mm -hmm. up. And then the billboards all focused on her as somebody who's not a good faith actor with the Democratic Party. First of all, well, by that, the way, she Swan, didn't vote for Hillary. She didn't vote for Hillary. I, listen, I wanted Nina Turner to win. Uh, and I respect her for not voting for Hillary. But, you know, when you it's a game, unfortunately. Well, and, okay, you, Corey and Bush, Corey Bush played a certain way. And if you're trying to win the Democratic primary, it seems to me, Professor Kay, that politics in america it's unfortunate it's what's in it for us you form a party and and you have to you get people to go out and network for you because there's something in it for them and if you have a candidate who is not part of the system who who took her ball and went home and said i'm not voting for hillary that's divisive i respect that I wish I had the courage not to vote for Hillary in 2016. I wish I had the courage not to vote for Biden in 2020. But I'm a paranoid Jew who knows what fascism looks like. And, you know, uh, I want Medicare for all, but I also don't want uh, more Mexicans and more black people rounded up. I know how bad things can get with the Republicans. But uh, if you're not if you're taking your ball and going home, are you the best candidate? Are you going to really win that many Democratic loyalists? Um, um, David, David, in the district, there was no other progressive champion to step up and run. Okay, Nina Turner is one of the. Right. Nina Turner is one of the leading figures in this new, uh, you know, in in, you know, energized progressive. block inside the Democratic Party. So she ran. She was way ahead in the polls. She would have won if this other money hadn't come in. Okay, she lost the election. I get that. However, so I don't think it was a bad idea for her to run. Okay, what she's trying to do is she's trying to bring forth a politics that looks at these places. What does Hedges call them? Sacrifice zones across the country. Cleveland, you know, east of downtown is a sacrifice zone in the American society. She's from there. She wants to see 40, 50 years of complete social stagnation end there and have the people from her community have an opportunity to have a prosperous and just life in our society. That's not coming from the Democratic Party establishment. I don't know. You can't go any further in history with the centrist Democrats running the party and believe and lie to yourself that they're going to do jack shit to change that equation because they're not. Okay, so she is saying, I want to come in here. I want to change that. These policies will create that change. They don't want her to have to do it. Okay, there was some reason to believe when she's way up ahead in the polls, they just let it go. She'd get into Congress. She joined the squad. They didn't do that. And they they went after her and they went after her really, really, really hard. I don't think she anticipated that it would be this hard because it was very hardcore. And by the way, for what it's worth, for what it's worth, she is not she, she is not talk that much. In Nina Turner's talking points, you can see one, two, three, five, ten Nina Turner speeches and maybe Palestinian human rights in Israel comes up. But if it's you know, within period when it's not in the cycle, it may not come up at all. I mean, and so to say that in the way that that's a central issue for a politician like Rashida Tlaib, it's not a central issue for Nina Turner. And I don't mean to, you know, I, I think that's just factually correct. OK, I think there's even a way in which DMFI saw a candidate who they could go after, who they had potential negatives to exploit. And they wanted the MFI. Oh, that's the that's the pack you're talking about from Melman. And they did put two million dollars into this thing. I mean, hardcore. But it's not to influence 
I mean, in the term, Congress votes? isn't going to end on foreign votes. affairs, you know? They Second spent $2 million dollars on, what, 30,000 votes? Yeah, something like that, of course. But they, they won. They, got, they, kept, they kept a squad down. They, uh, you know, ostensibly, of course, Nina Turner wouldn't be voting for, uh, you know, policies relevant to Israel and Palestine in the way that they would want. But it's certainly not a de- definitional issue of Nina Turner as a, as a public profile politician. And, um, you know, she's all about her community, all about the working class in America, all about, all about the black working class in America and, and everything else about economic justice and social justice. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. I believe in democracy and I believe no amount of money can beat you if you have God on your side. If you if you're if you have the moral high ground and you can articulate that. Oh, she has she has that in droves, David. She she's she can match any Republican in in quoting chapter and verse from the Bible. So, you know. But she lost. Yeah, yeah. And, to, and I'm, you know, I, again, I wanted her to win, and I wanted Bernie to win. Mm-hmm. You, you got to do a post mortem, Professor K. And and say, okay, two people I really wanted to win. What what did you do? You did something wrong. You can't just blame this. this well, the, what's interesting is in the is, if the black vote is as close as Alan's, you know, early assessment indicates, then presumably you, you have to ask yourself also about what happened in the South over and over again. Hillary just wiped Bernie in the South. Um, I'm not even sure that um, that Obama was necessary to beat. Bernie in the South, once Clyburn was determined, um, you know, I mean, I wish there's this assumption on the part of, you know, white chattering class that that blacks are somehow collectively progressive. Right. And that, that they're no more or less progressive than than anyone else, probably, who is generally associated with the Democratic Party. But it is also the case that they have their own. There's a power structure in black communities. And look, the the Democratic Party had Clinton and the Clinton. Somehow the Clintons were able to, you know, for some time garner that kind of sympathy and support. And similarly, look, Biden was Barack Obama's vice president. And that must have weighed in to some extent, had to be significant. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You're the uh, executive director, Alan, of Progressive Democrats of America. We're losing the argument on defunding the police. They have they have taken the linguistic high ground. They've they've taken that away from us. And and the Republicans are using defund the police as a cudgel against us. The African-American community probably is not too some members of the african-american community is not too keen on defunding exactly that's the whole point look look i've said this before i get you know smacked a little for it defund the police was a not a smart rallying cry just wasn't i'm not saying i'm what i'm saying is look demilitarize the police there's a whole host of things that would conjure up a whole different set of of images so you know the other thing is that, again, there are some members of the the crack sentencing that's so unfair to African-American males stems in part uh, from African-American leaders in Harlem and communities that were being ravaged by heroin and crack, where they went to the politicians and asked for stiffer sentencing. I don't want to sound like Tucker Carlson here, but there are members of the african-american community who wanted these drugs out out and they asked for stiffer sentencing so the idea that white people know what's good for blacks there are a lot of law and order black voters who don't okay, want a bunch of stuff there first of all i think uh, that didn't really play large in this race but of course it's not an irrelevant subject well, maybe one of the reasons it didn't is nina of course had been 
representing uh, the district in, in the Senate. And I think she was on Cleveland City Council previous. And in fact, one of her initiatives as a state senator to work was with then Governor Kasich on, I believe, something having to do with police officers who kept getting killed. So as you can see, that's sort of on the other side of the spectrum from you know, the, the shots are defund the police. First of all, that did that 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 particular slogan and call came directly from the Black Lives Matter movement and leadership of that movement and and not from, you know, the white support that flooded the streets. Um, but, um, you know, I think those issues are, are going to play out and how much the Republicans will try to lean on those. We saw the results in New York City. I do think um, that was, you know, we are we are in a situation where the Republicans may try to revive that as a big electoral talking point because, Apparently, crime statistics and violent crime statistics are going back up in mm-hmm. the United States. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. You know, but uh, you know, you know. So that that'll play out. But it wasn't a big issue in this race. We have uh, three more minutes. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think the left. Uh, I believe in accountability. And I'd like to see more accountability on our side. Well, you know, you know, you bring up a lot of questions about about, for instance, um, just the pragmatic. I don't want to get into that word because that was a bit of a hot button word on the left right now this past week in the American left. But the pragmatics of dealing with campaigns. So just today, very good news. uh, Jessica Cisneros, who almost won in South Texas, knocking out one of the most reactionary Democrats in the House. Uh, Henry Cuellar, totally in lockstep with the fossil fuel industry, is going to try to run again. Now, the big issue there is she came very close. A lot of reason to believe that she could win this time. However, the pragmatics are we probably are going to see now explicit Republican support. How do you combat that? How do you expose that? How do you get more momentum to win when maybe now a handful of the percentile of the vote in the district would just swing over to support this Democrat? who have been Republicans previously. And I think Texas doesn't have open races, so they'd have to go and register, et cetera. So, you know, we got to be pragmatic in all of these races. Candidates have Achilles heels. Yes, Nina Turner had things at the other side exploited. It was a unique race. Um, It was very close for a primary race. It wasn't a blowout. Okay, Cisneros was very close. It would be brilliant to get Jessica Cisneros into the House. She's a fantastic progressive. And the swing from Henry Cuellar would be massive. So, you know, there's going to be other battles to fight. And I think Nina Turner is definitely, definitely going to be very uh, present in the media. I think she's going to remain very active. And I think she's not going to lose her status on the progressive left, even though she didn't win this congressional seat. So I think that's that's good. And that's good to look forward. That's all the sense I have from from Nina. But, yeah, it was a race. And you're right, David. It has to be assessed. And, uh, you know, if there's going to be a round two in this race, you know, Cori Bush lost the first time. There are other people who are pro, who are big progressive champions. And we have we have a more we, because of Cori Bush sleeping on the Capitol steps. Right. We have the extension of the CDC eviction moratorium on evictions. Thanks to Cori Bush. There are successes. Let me. And also, me, Ohio, by the way, is losing a district. There's a very good chance that district's going to get redrawn. Uh, it may get redrawn favorably to Nina. And um, and also, this is interesting, too, because if she had won, they almost certainly the Republicans were going to try to redraw it to get rid of her. So paradoxically, her losing this race could actually set the table for her getting a seat that she can win more handily going forward. Great. Or at least for eight years until they try it again. So. Let me let me just offer up this and then uh, I like doing this earlier uh, uh, than uh, if you guys can do it. Uh, I've been saying this on the show and I'm going to repeat it because it's important. I was a full time comedian before I became a comedy writer. I'd say about 12 years and I'm limited in what I can do as a performer. But at I became as good a comedian as I was going to be. And I would go on stage and get an audience to laugh. I did everything right that I could possibly do. I fed everything into the machine, garbage in, garbage out. And the audience, I could do an hour on stage and make the audience laugh from beginning, middle to end. One little problem 
could not get the audience to love me. Could not get the audience to, and I'd go, they don't love me. They do not love me. I'm making them laugh harder than people who are way more successful than I am because they love those other comedians. They do not love me. And it's unfair, but that's the stand-up game. That's the stand-up game. If you cannot get the audience to love you, you're a failure. Politics is unfair. Hillary was, whatever you think, should have been president and not Donald Trump. But there was something, and then she did win the popular vote. Uh, Bernie should have gotten the nomination. Now, you can tell me it was fixed. You can tell me that big money went after Bernie and Nina Turner. And in the end, if you cannot get the voters to root for you, to see in you a narrative, a story, and it's bullshit and it's beneath us because we read and we're interested in policy and we have contempt for narrative and story and emotion. But that's not the game. The game in politics, Professor K, is there has to be a, a story, a narrative, a connection with the candidate. Otherwise, you don't win. That's the game. And, and the problem with the Democratic Party is it's populated by too many fucking hyper-educated technocrats who feed everything into a fucking computer and then they get the printout and they think, I'll say this and I'll win. No, you're dead inside. And the voters see that. I'm not saying that about Nina Turner and I'm not saying that about Bernie. But I'm saying the left has to be really careful about this garbage in, garbage out syndrome where you think you can just feed everything into a computer and be mathematically correct and soulless and not connect with the voter. That, I think, is the problem. And there there's some people I know on the left who are loathsome human beings who rather be right than win. And you're looking at one right now. Me. You know, no. <laughs> Harvey Har Har should speak. I spoke too much, but I do want to say this. Look, Nina, def there definitely is a problem along who gets elected. And, and I'm not and saying that about Nina Turner. No, no, no. no but there, let's be honest, too. There is. Look, if you cast yourself as a working class American, even in majority working class districts, there is this sort of like, you know, the professional class to carry yourself that way is what the political class, especially Democratic electeds, are supposed to look like and everything. And there's a lot of bias against people who come from the working class. Uh, and, um, you know, that plays out in a lot of races, too. People's expectations. Okay. Are, yeah. Before we got, you know, I, I've been waiting for a long time to hear what happened that we're now convinced that Biden just literally screwed us on infrastructure. Oh, he to complete the whole bipartisan thing. He, you take electric charging vehicles. $50 billion in his proposal from the American Families Plan. Bipartisan deal, 7.5. This is supposed to be the climate bill. Oh, yeah. I, climate that I get you. That, that I already, yeah. It's going to be no climate bill at all. You know. You're talking about, you're talking about the second bill, not the first. Yeah, well, they have a rule in this for the second bill that you can't, quote, unquote, double dip. It's just made up like a new school a schoolyard rule has been made up. And Biden has said... You can't double dip. This is where brick and mortar infrastructure is covered in this bill. It, transportation now is in the little bill. None of it will be in the big bill. Water, all in the little bill, none in the big bill. So if it's in the little bill, it cannot be added to in the big bill. Well, how does he get to dictate the, the, the rule when Bernie is the head of the uh, budget committee? Well, it's no hard and fast rule. It's just that the, the people it's negotiating. It's saying to the it's making a promise to Mansion Cinema and Republicans. Right. 
I'll I'll vote on the bipartisanship bill if you agree to this. But if you go ahead and do you get more out of reconciliation on the second bill, I don't trust you anymore. They're negotiating both bills at yeah. the same time. They're pretending to just be negotiating the bipartisan bill, but they're nego- right. They're negotiating the, the second bill as well. And I, I understand that from a political standpoint, it's not fair. Nothing's fair with the Republicans, but it's not fair to say, OK, we won't pay. We'll only pay X amount of mon- mon- X amount of money to clean the water you win on this and then turn around and spend an extra 30 billion dollars on cleaning the water on the second bill that's not that's what they're negotiating it seems i don't know that seems how it gets done in washington Uh, that's the game it's it's terrible politics there's no reason to do that you even undermine your own party you know, you yeah. want to win midterm elections, have the Democrats do it all and leave the Republicans completely out of it. They, I they agree with you. Yeah. Right. Ridiculous. I agree with you. I agree with you. Uh, well, but, you know, yeah, there, I got a little I got a little huffy today. I'm sorry. Guys. Yeah, yes. there is such thing before you go, uh, Professor uh, uh, Reverend Barry W. Lynn, there is uh, you're we'll start and end with the same subject. Economics, the multiplier effect. We don't know what a trillion dollars on the first bill will actually do to this economy. When the government spends one dollar, that translates into twenty dollars by the time it spreads from one person to the next. And then you loan that money. So it that one trillion dollars may set off a chain reaction that we can't anticipate in terms of positivity, in terms of what, you know, yeah, fair, yeah point. fair point. You don't know. We're, it's uncharted territory. I'm not defending. Anyway, let's do it earlier next week. Sure. Love okay. It. Thank, Thank you. you.